SpaceX has entered the final leg of their preparations to launch the single largest and most powerful rocket ever created, the Starship. This is an accomplishment that has been years in the making since the very first test flights at Boca Chica in 2019. It's taken SpaceX an amazing quantity of blood, sweat, and explosions to get where they are today. August 2022 could be the time that we finally see a fully realized Starship Super Heavy launch to orbit. But what is that going to look like? How will it work and what does this mean for the future of spaceflight? Let's talk about it. We can begin with the star of the show, the Orbital Starship Second Stage, or simply referred to as the ship. The true test of this entire program will be whether or not this Flash Gordon looking extra pointy stainless steel spacecraft can actually make it into orbit around the Earth. And then, as if that wasn't enough, it has to come back down for a controlled landing. This has only ever been accomplished by the Space Shuttle. So, not only is SpaceX launching the biggest rocket ever constructed, and by far the most powerful, but this is also destined to be the first ever vehicle to reach low Earth orbit and then come back down for a propulsive landing. Unlike the shuttle, which essentially became a glider airplane as soon as it re-entered the atmosphere and drifted back to the surface for a smooth landing, the Starship will plummet from space like a skydiver. But instead of a parachute, the ship will fire up three Raptor rocket engines to slow and control its descent to the ground. Or, in this case, the ocean. No one knows exactly how this test is going to pan out, and one thing we definitely don't want to see is several hundred tons of steel and rocket fuel just belly flop directly from space into solid ground. Okay, that's a bit of a lie. It would be spectacular to watch that happen, but the aftermath and the repercussions would be terrible. We've seen what happens when a starship fails to land from a 10 kilometer high test flight, so just imagine what could happen on the way back from several hundred kilometers. Anyway, this is going to be a very different procedure from landing a Falcon 9 booster. The altitude of the Falcon 9 when the booster stage separates is only about 100 kilometers. For an idea of what that looks like, it's about the same altitude that Blue Origin's flying dildo sends tourists into space. The ship is going to reach an altitude of 250 kilometers to certify that Starship is an orbital rocket. Getting back down from that height is going to be tricky, especially for a vehicle so large. More surface area equals more drag. This is why the latest builds of the Starship have been covered in heat shield tiles. Or at least half of the ship is covered. That's the side that will perform the belly flop. The other half will be safe from the intense heat and flames of re-entry, so it doesn't need the tiles. They add a lot of weight to the rocket, so you want to use as few of them as possible. The most likely candidate for the first orbital flight is going to be ship number 24. This iteration seems to be fully constructed, but as of today at least, it has yet to undergo any kind of engine testing. This build of the Starship has six engines installed, Three in the center are gimbaled raptors that will be used for the landing burn. We've seen these perform in the initial Starship landing tests last year. The raptor gimbal allows the engine to swivel around 15 degrees in any direction, and the high torque motors of the gimbal can move each of the three engines independently at an incredible speed. This movement of the engines is what controls the ship's final descent and landing. Prior to relighting the engines, the ship will use giant aero fins at the nose and tail to control the fall. The same way that an experienced skydiver can use their arms and legs to steer through the air. The outer three engines are still raptors, but they are optimized to work in the vacuum of space. That's why they have such a gigantic nozzle attached. This maximizes the expansion ratio of the exhaust, which maximizes the efficiency of the rocket engine. These three will kick on after the first stage separation, 
which usually happens around 100 kilometers up and will propel the ship to its target altitude of 250 kilometers. Future variations of the Starship might increase this engine count to nine in total by adding three more vacuum raptors. Those might be necessary in order to get the Starship's maximum cargo capacity of over 100 metric tons to a high Earth orbit, or even beyond that to the Moon and Mars. We've also seen Ship 24 fitted with a Starlink satellite dispenser unit. This is a new take on how to deploy the company's second generation of communication satellites. The current procedure for deploying a batch of Starlinks is for the Falcon 9 upper stage to release all 60 in one big cluster. Basically, the ship will slowly rotate as it releases the satellite carrier, and that centrifugal force will cause the satellites to disperse. And then each satellite uses its own thrusters to transit to the target orbit. The idea for Starship is to fire the satellites out through a slot in the side of the hull. This is obviously on the non-shielded side of the rocket, and according to renderings from SpaceX, the V2 Starlink satellites will just shoot out two at a time from a mechanical launcher inside the ship. It's starting to look very likely that SpaceX will use the first orbital flight test of the Starship to deploy a batch of Starlink V2 satellites, because the ship is already fitted with the slot and the launcher mechanism. This makes Ship 24 a unitasker rocket. The only thing that it can do is launch Starlinks. It's useless for any other kind of a job. This is kind of cool to think that the first flight of the Starship will also be a fully operational mission, but it's also kind of a bummer at the same time. So we all remember the first flight of the Falcon Heavy rocket, and a lot of the reason it was so memorable is because Elon put his original Tesla Roadster with an astronaut driver into the rocket's cargo fairing and deployed the pair into an orbital path that would take them all the way to Mars and back. We'd kind of been hoping to see something similar happen with the Starship. I mean, the rocket is easily big enough and powerful enough to put a Cybertruck into orbit. You could even fit the cab of a Tesla Semi in there if you wanted. The possibilities are just wild. But doing something like that would require the Starship to have a mechanized fairing section that can open the top half of the ship like a clamshell. The whole point of the ship is that it is fully reusable, so that mechanism would also have to close again and reseal the ship perfectly to survive re-entry and landing, which is obviously going to be complicated, and that's likely the reason that they devised this Pez dispenser style Starlink deployer that only requires one thin slot to open and close on the ship's hull. And again, because Ship 24 is already set up for Starlink dispensing, it can't possibly deploy anything else, which again, is kind of unfortunate. Also, just wanted to let you know about our Discord server. We've got over 1,500 members and host regular live watch parties within the community. We have some big events coming up for the first Starship launch, Artemis launch, and Tesla AI day. So if you aren't already, join our Discord server using the link in the description. Also wanted to give a quick shout out to our amazing Discord community. Here is our question of the week, and this was our favorite answer. And here is the meme of the week winner. If the ship is the star of the show, then the super heavy booster is the supporting cast, equally as important for making the production a success. The booster section of the rocket is the muscle that gets the ship past the dense atmosphere and strong gravity of the Earth and sets it on a path to orbit. And moving a gigantic heavy ship full of heavy cargo to orbital velocity requires an unprecedented amount of muscle. In its current configuration, the Super Heavy booster is fitted with 33 Raptor engines. Each engine produces 230 metric tons of thrust, so 33 multiplied by 230 equals 7,590 tons of force, pushing this rocket towards space. The current record holder for most powerful booster is NASA's Saturn V moon rocket, which came in at around 3,500 metric tons of thrust. So, the Super Heavy isn't just an incremental step up, this is more than double the power of the previously most powerful thing ever created. 
and this has been causing SpaceX some difficulties over the past year. The first thing they did was upgrade the Raptor engine from version 1 to version 2. The original orbital candidate, booster number 4 from last year, was loaded with 29 of the first generation Raptor, which only produced about 180 tons of thrust. So that brings us down to 5,220 tons total, which again is still more powerful than the Saturn V, but also a lot less powerful than the current booster number 7. So it's almost certain that if Elon had been allowed to just YOLO that first 420 Starship Super Heavy stack into the air, it never would have reached escape velocity, the whole thing would have come tumbling back down to Earth in failure, and made two gigantic explosive splashdowns into the ocean. Which again, would probably look sick, but would not have been good for the program. Obviously, you can learn a lot by trying and failing, and SpaceX has done plenty of that, but when you're already on thin ice with the FAA as it is, it's going to be much better if they can go explosion-free from here on out. And the big test for that is going to be whether or not this booster can land. Or, more specifically, if it can be caught. So, the plan for the ship is to set it down carefully in the Pacific Ocean near Hawaii. But according to the latest FAA filing by SpaceX, they might have significantly more ambitious plans for the booster. The flight path from Boca Chica will take the Starship out over the Gulf of Mexico, where the booster will separate and come straight back down over the ocean. The easy option would be to have it perform a controlled landing on the water, just like the ship. The booster comes down a bit differently than the ship because it doesn't go to orbit, it doesn't have to do a flaming belly flop maneuver. The booster comes straight back down like a javelin being steered by a giant grid fins at the top of the rocket. It's going to burn the Raptor engines to slow down its descent, starting with all 33 and then gradually cutting off in groups as it gets closer to the ground. The outer ring of fixed engines shuts down first, leaving the central group which are all on gimbal mechanisms. These will help steer as it comes down. Then the middle ring of engines cut out, leaving just the central cluster of three Raptors. The same as on the ship's section. These handle final positioning adjustments and actually slow the booster down to the point where it is hovering in mid-air. At this point, it could just drop gracefully into the sea. The booster doesn't have landing legs, so it can't touch down on a drone ship the way a Falcon 9 does. But SpaceX has presented an option B for the first orbital test flight. The booster might return to Starbase and be caught by the launch tower. We know this is the eventual plan for landing both the ship and the booster to have them make a controlled descent back to the exact same location that they launched from, where gigantic robotic arms on the launch tower will grab the rocket out of the air as it hovers above the ground. This is an insane idea. It's totally unprecedented, and the fact that SpaceX is even considering this for the first launch attempt is beyond ambitious. It should be possible if they can land a falcon on a bullseye on a floating raft in the ocean, then there's no reason to think that they can't land a significantly more advanced booster into the waiting arms of a giant robot tower. But even if one thing goes wrong during that landing, then the booster will crash and explode and take a lot of expensive stuff along with it. And that links back into the testing process for Booster 7. This rocket has been through a lot already. There are two key tests to determine if a rocket is safe to launch. The cryo-proofing test and the static fire test. But SpaceX has taken that one step further and implemented their own can-crusher test. Or at least that's what the fans call it. I think the technical term is Max-Q Test Rig. This is a device that simulates the force of a launch on the structure of the rocket. When the booster or ship is strapped into the rig, it will have force applied from both the top and the bottom. Pistons push up on the base of the rocket to simulate the force of engines, while cables pull down on the nose to simulate the force of air pressure. The can crusher test resulted in a collapsed oxygen transfer tube on Booster 7, 
which we had thought would lead to the booster being scrapped in favor of number 8. But SpaceX actually repaired the tube on booster 7 and sent it back to the can crusher, which it passed. Then the booster goes on to cryoproofing, which is the process of filling the fuel tanks with liquid nitrogen. This rapid internal cooling is going to create an immense amount of pressure on the structure and can sometimes result in the entire rocket just crumpling in on itself. But Booster 7 survived that test too. Then it's on to static firing, which is when they strap the rocket down so that it can't go anywhere and then fuel it up and light the engines to make sure that everything flows and burns properly. That's where Booster 7 hit another snag. So, to start the Raptor engine, you have to externally spin a pair of turbines attached to each engine. That's the process that SpaceX was testing when the booster had a minor explosion last month. Just spinning the turbine without igniting the engine is going to cause methane and oxygen to flow through the engine and exit out of the bottom through the nozzle. By spinning the turbines on 33 rocket engines, they released a lot of excess methane into the air directly below the launch mount. That methane cloud reached a nearby generator and boom, giant fireball. That wasn't good. It could have been much worse, but it still caused some damage. But again, a learning experience. The explosion charred a bunch of plumbing and wiring on the orbital launch mount, which now has to be thoroughly inspected, repaired, and replaced. And it also sent Booster 7 back to base for repairs yet again. Now, every engine has to be removed and inspected and possibly replaced before any more progress can be made. The combination of damage to the launch mount and the booster has obviously set back the timeline a bit. Elon was first saying that the orbital launch would happen in July. Now that's moved to August, and it very well could still happen this month. We'll have to see. But Elon does have a pretty ambitious timeline laid out once the Starship has proven itself to be capable of reaching orbit. He wants to fly one Starship mission per month to start building out the next constellation of Starlink V2 satellites. So once this rocket gets going, we're going to be seeing a lot of it. And that frequency will accelerate over time to the point where SpaceX will likely replace the Falcon 9 entirely with the Starship. Falcon 9 launches are up to about one per week, sometimes multiple per week. Elon has even talked about launching multiple starships per day, but that is likely very far down the line. So that's what we can expect to see over the coming month or maybe two months. Realistically, this launch is not very likely to happen in August, but it's almost certainly going down before the end of this year. What do you think is going to happen? triumphant success or explosive failure? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That is so important for getting our content out to more people. If you enjoy the content, then you'd probably also enjoy our weekly newsletter. So sign up with the link down below at theteslaspace.com. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who are listed on the screen now. You help us make the best content we can, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.